You're listening to uh, FM 107.5 and Chats and Tunes here this afternoon and uh, we have on the line Shane Dowling from the Kangaroo Court. Shane, thanks so much for joining us today. No problem. Great. Now, what's been happening in the Kangaroo Court? Uh, quite a lot. Um, obviously, big news. Uh, started yesterday. Julian Assange out of jail in the UK. It's moved very quickly. Well, quickly as far as the media is concerned, obviously there's a lot of uh, negotiations in the back rooms. Um, and it started being reported yesterday, I can't remember exactly when, somewhere around midday uh, or a bit before. He had been uh, released from Belmarsh Prison in the UK. He was on a plane by that time on his way uh, to a Pacific island, which is controlled by the U United States. And this already happened. He's already actually been gone through the court there. He's been uh, sentenced to 60 months jail, which is a time served in the UK, uh, five years and two months. And he's been let out free. And he had to hire his own plane, which is very unusual. It's costing him something like $500,000 US. He doesn't have the money. The government, the Australian government have paid for it, but he has to pay them back and they've already set up a crowdfunding uh, to try and raise money to pay for that plane. I don't know where it's at. I had a look a couple of hours ago and it was already at $250,000 or something. So they're already halfway there where it's at now. I don't know. But given the speed they'd raise that, they're probably going to have no problem raising a half a million US. How would you find that? Is that is How's that uh, termed online? How would you find that? Just well, the, the, the best source is either the WikiLeaks Twitter account or Stella Assange, her Twitter account. It was called X now. Yep. Now, I could, I could just do it uh, while I'm actually here, uh, if you want. Yep. Uh, Stella, we'll search, it comes up, Stella Assange, and she's promoting the crowdfund, obviously, uh, being the wife, it's obviously a burden on her too. Oh, yeah. But if you scroll down her Twitter account, you'll be able to find it. There's somewhere I'm going through now quickly. Uh, where is it? I can't find it. I'll start. I'll that's, keep on that's talking. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be on Twitter, would it? It'd be out there somewhere on, on a lot of no, other the platforms. Link, the link for it, here it is, Free Assange. I've just clicked on the link. Freeassange.org, donate. Uh, oh, that hasn't got a counter. Yeah, it has got a counter now. They've raised $297,000, or pounds, I mean, of the oh. targeted £520,000. Right, and that's probably because it's US dollars. Okay, yeah. So, and that's on a website called Crowdfunder. So, if you go onto crowdfunder. dot com. dot au, uh, you'll be able and t type search Julian Assange. You'll be able to find. Here it is now. I've just found it again. Uh, Two hundred ninety-seven thousand pounds. Yep. So right. it's not too hard to find. Uh, like I said, I don't think you're going to have too hard a problem uh, raising that money. But we'll should know tomorrow. I yep. suspect they'll raise it tomorrow, by tomorrow, and if they haven't, well, people can start looking to the Nate again. Yep. Now, it's moved really quickly. He's, I can't remember the name of the island, doesn't matter. It's about a couple thousand kilometres above uh, Papua New Guinea in the Pacific there. Um, and he's already on the flight way back to Australia. He's meant to arrive, I think it's something like four and a half hours. Once again, you can go on the internet, and I can actually see is playing on a website called, uh, if people want to know, flightaware.com, and it's Vesta Jet 199. Once again, if you go onto Twitter and look at WikiLeaks, and uh, you'll see them tweeting the link. So you can actually follow the plane coming back, which is uh, this technology nowadays. It's four hours and 32 minutes before it lands in Canberra. And I also note WikiLeaks are advertising that they're going to do a press conference around 9.30 tonight in Canberra. Right. Well, that'd be interesting. I, I assume that'll be uh, with Julian Assange. Everything's happening so quick, you're just reading bits and pieces here and there. Uh, I, I noticed WikiLeaks just announced a press conference. They didn't say exactly uh, who's going to be there, but almost guaranteed Julian Assange is going to be there. Hmm. A lot of it is really interesting because Labor Party have tried to jump on board and take credit. The Prime Minister... Uh, Kevin Rudd, who's currently the ambassador in the US, uh, United States, 
I can't remember the exact name, but we got a different uh, title, but equivalent to Ambassador in the UK. Uh, he's trying to take some credit too. They're all jumping on the bandwagon trying to take credit. And, Julian, and to be fair, Julian Assange's lawyer has come out and thanked them all. Right. But I have a real issue with that, potentially, but we'll see how it pans out over the next few days. Because by thanking Kevin Rudd and the Australian government, it undermines other whistleblowers like David McBride, who's in jail, yep. and uh, other whistleblowers that are potentially facing jail, like Richard Boyle, mm -hmm. uh, the Australian Taxation Office whistleblower. The reality is the Australian government have done absolutely nothing for whistleblowers, and they're happy to jail them as much as the previous government did Scott Morrison. Mm -hmm. So I have an issue with them thanking the government, but... Let's see how, see how it pans out. The really, reality is they're caught in a, between a rock and a hard place. Because Julian Assange was not in maximum security. That's how we term it. I've done a couple of short stints in jail for breaching suppression orders. Right. Uh, well, in relation to my writing articles exposing corruption. And I can tell you now, Julian Assange was in the equivalent of Supermax, which is where you only get an out an hour a day. That, that's like for 30 or 40 prisoners in New South Wales, that's it. Right. Maximum security, you're still getting out six hours a day, you know, being able to mingle with other prisoners, being able to exercise, being able to work, do all that sort of stuff. He was in supermax style uh, prison, only being out, allowed out an hour a day. That's really torture. For five years, that's really torture. Mm. So he really didn't have much of an option. He only had to plead guilty to one crime, uh, instead of the 15 or 20 charges he, he was facing. And so he negotiated a ride down. In the US, we're in a bad situation because they were about to lose the next uh, court case. And we know that because they'd lost the previous two. And I've written an article about it today on my website, Can Record Australia? And they'd lost the previous two. They were meant to give assurances to the UK court that Julian Assange... Wouldn't face a death penalty. Well, they gave that assurance. That's fine. But they also meant to give assurances that he would be protected under the First Amendment, which is a protection of free speech, which all Americans they're entitled to that protection. Mm -hmm. But they refused to give that. They said he could argue it when he gets to the United States. Well, that's not giving an assurance. That's just saying he can argue it. Well, right. he can argue anything. Yep, yep. The UK courts ask for these assurances because otherwise he's been discriminated discriminated against because of his nationality yep yep because they're not going to give it to him but they'll give it to all americans mm -hmm. and he basically it's a human rights sort of thing and the uk courts wouldn't extradite him unless they had those insurances well the last two court cases americans could have and should have given those insurances and they failed and they failed a, a week or two ago or a month or two ago again to give those insurances so they were guaranteed to lose the next court case because the previous two were about whether he had he sought leave to appeal. And because they failed to give those assurances, he was granted leave to appeal. And because they failed to give those assurances, he was guaranteed to win his appeal. So they were about to lose. And, they, and the court date was set down for July 9th and 10th. So it's only a couple of weeks ago. They were desperate for a settlement because Assange would have walked free. Now, we'll get back to that in a minute, him walking free, but he would have walked free at some stage, and they would have lost, and they would have lost a lot of faith because they spent years and millions of dollars trying to have him charged and uh, extradited, etc., and they would have failed, and they would have lost faith. And they were about to lose that in a couple of weeks with the court hearing. So they were desperate for any sort of settlement, and so they settled by getting Assange to plead guilty to one crime. Uh... But Assange, even though he knew he was going to win, um, he still could have been stuck in jail for another year or two years. Mm. Yep. They, the judges could have dragged out the decision for six months, 12 months, yep. before they handed down a judgment. Then the Americans could have potentially, potentially appealed to, the, say, the United Kingdom Supreme Court, etc. So he could have been stuck there for another couple of years, and he already had five years in basically torture. Torture mm -hmm. situation. Yep. You know, being allowed out one, one hour a day. That's not maximum security in Australian standards. That's super max right. uh, for the worst of the worst criminals. So 
he really had to agree and they gave him an offer too good to refuse so he, he settled the Americans they got, got him to uh, confess to at least one crime so they saved faith all those people in the public service the Justice Department the Foreign Affairs in the United States they get to keep their jobs because I suspect a lot of them would have been sacked if Assange had walked free hmm. and the Australian government they're jumping on board trying to take credit but let's see how that pans out over the next few weeks, next few months. Um, be interesting to see what Assange says himself once he's got the microphone in hand. Yes, Whether absolutely. that be today, later today, or in a week or two. For sure, absolutely. Um, so, now the other big story is Peter Dutton, who's grabbed the headlines, grabbed control of the narrative for the media in relation to his nuclear policy. And you start looking at it, and there is no nuclear policy. It doesn't exist. It's just a straight-out scam. Now, people can argue all they like whether we should or shouldn't have nuclear uh, power in Australia. That's fine. You know, other countries have it, so we can argue it, and we could and should debate it to some degree, uh, at least. But when you come out with a policy and you don't actually have a policy, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just a straight-out scam. And I sort of did the research, and Peter Dutton's on record, on video, saying that 12 months ago, saying, no, we're not going to his, his policy is not for nuclear plants, large-scale nuclear plants. But so sometime in the last 12 months, he's changed his mind. So I started looking at it, and over the last 12 months, he's gotten very cozy with Gina Reinhart, the like, huge coal miner. So she has a policy of wanting nuclear power. But the reality is, it's 100% guaranteed she couldn't care less either. But by pushing the nuclear power plant policy, it undermines investment for renewable energy, solar, wind farms, etc., battery. Because the people who are looking to invest, they're sitting back thinking, well, if Peter Dutton wins the next election, our investments could be worth nothing. Yep. they're going to go nuclear so the scheme is to promote nuclear undermine the confidence to invest by the major companies and slow down the transition to renewable energy which is uh, wind farms and uh, solar and batteries etc and, and potentially other other uh, sources I, I hear people from time to time it's not my expertise uh, the environment or uh, power but my expertise is corruption people lying and deceiving yep and this just stood out a mile so i've had a look at it and i've written an article about it a few days ago uh peter dutton's relationship with gina reinhardt the reality is peter dutton has a legacy of when he was in power as home affairs minister a looker looking after his mate with multi-billion dollar grants for the uh menace island and the in other islands where they're housing uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like, cost them something like a million, two million, three million dollars a year per refugee to house them. What? And, and you have a look, 60 Minutes did a good story, I think it was back in February, on one of the companies, I think it was Paladin, and it starts off showing you a big yacht worth 30 million that we paid for, for one of the owners of these... Uh, companies that are running the refugee camps on Menace Island and Nauru and that. <laughs> He's driving around a $30 million boat that we've paid for so, because the profit margins are huge. So Peter Dutton's reputation or, or legacy of handing out contracts and looking after his mates uh, isn't real good. Hopefully the National Anti-Corruption Commission are having a good look at it now. I know they've received complaints in relation to that. But the bottom line with that is to sort of have a look at what's under, underlying the so-called nuclear policy. The reality is he hasn't got one. We've got no costing. Uh, they don't even know how many nuclear reactors are going to have at each plant, etc., etc., etc. And I've, I've read where the experts are saying it takes 15 to 20 years anyhow. And the coal plants, the coal... Uh, the coal plants which are currently supplying a lot of electricity are going to all be closed within 10 years so the nuclear power won't even be here by the time they've closed mm. 
So we need something a lot faster than nuclear mm -hmm. power, at least in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. And I think the last one, I think I uh, mentioned, it's worth mentioning again. I think I mentioned it last time. Scott Morrison was out as one of the six people referred to the National Anti-Corruption Commission by the Robo Debt Royal Commission. I make out the prima facie case. I think it's worth mentioning again because uh, the inspector, Gail Furness, the inspector of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, her job's to oversee the National Anti-Corruption Commission. And if people make allegations of corruption or uh, dereliction of duty or whatever against the National Anti-Corruption Commission, it's her job to investigate. Well, we know she's investigating. She's put out a public statement. She's investigating. They received 900 complaints. And she said some of those complaints allege corruption by the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which is the ultimate insult for them, for them to be investigated less than 12 months into their uh, being set up. Um, that decision is obviously still out there and it's probably a few months away at least. And we'll uh, keep an eye on that. Other than that, uh, Robert, that's pretty well it at the moment. Well, Shane, you've done well. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk next week, but keep up the good work. Have a go. Talk to you later. Cheers.